Well, good morning. <laughs> it's okay. How many of you ever heard <clears throat> this phrase, no man is an island? I've heard this for most of my life, and uh, um, I, this week as I was preparing for, for today, I began to think about it even more so. No man is an island, and, uh, and it piqued my curiosity. Where did this come from? Because where I heard it from originally was um, a Bon Jovi song called Santa Fe. <laughs> A long time ago, and uh, he begins, um, they say, no man is an island, is how he begins the song, and uh, I began to ask the question, well, who's they? Have you ever asked that question about something? Because people often will say, well, they, they say blah, 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 and so I was like, who's this they? As I began to search, uh, I began to realize that Bon Jovi wasn't the only one to use this phrase. There was probably, um, just going through Amazon Music, there was over 20 different songs that use this as their title of, the, of a song, No Man Is an Island. Whether it's reggae, whether it's the Irish pop band, The Scripts, or whether it's 10th Avenue North, a Christian band, or uh, Joan Baez from the 70s folk music, um, or Dennis Brown with some reggae, it's all over the place. But who's they that they got this from? And so I did a little bit of work on this, and there's this guy named John Don, and uh, he was from the 1600s. He was a poet from England, and <clears throat> one winter in 1623, he finds himself sick, and he's alone, isolated, not sure what he was feeling and, and what he was going through. Maybe it was he was tired of feeling isolated, or maybe he had been pulled out um, from his normal demands of his life, the people that he was caring for and these different roles that he had. But he finds himself isolated in this sickness, which we have nothing to, to connect with that, right? We didn't go through a pandemic or anything. <clears throat> so he finds himself, and he writes these words in Meditation 17. He says, no man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. And if a clod be washed away by the sea, Europe is less, as well as if a promontory were, as well as any manner of thy friends or of thine own were. Any man's death diminishes me because I am involved in mankind. No man is an island. We live in a culture who often functions that way. Hyper-individualistic, autonomous. And as we spoke about last week, we find ourselves in this culture that's burning out. They're exhausted, they're tired, they're worry, weary. They got nothing left. And one of those symptoms is loneliness or feeling isolated. There was an article uh, that Cigna put out in 2021. It said that men and women were uh, nearly 60% of men and women, slightly different on that, but almost, almost the same, they expressed loneliness. 60% of the United States expressing loneliness, okay? That number increases in age, and ironically, it's not if you're a senior or if you're a shut-in, you feel more lonely. 80% of young adults said they feel lonely. This hyper-connected social media, Instagram, Snapchat, Facebook, which they don't really use anymore, and all, this, all these other tools that they have at their disposal to live connected and be in the know, they feel more isolated than everybody else. And there's two major ways that this is impacting it, impacting us as a culture or as a nation. It, says, it said that uh, it costs employers $154 billion in lost productivity because of absenteeism that's related to loneliness 
or depression being pulled, being felt like they can't engage because of this. $154 billion. And then it says, uh, it more than doubles your likelihood of mental health and physical health challenges if you find yourself in this category of feeling isolated and alone. There's no reason that in Genesis 1, when God is creating everything, the one thing they said was not good was when it said that man was alone. That's not good. When we think about our culture and our environment of what we're laboring and running around for, we sometimes feel connected because of social media and different things. We have cell phones that are probably our biggest relationship that we have because we use it for everything and we're always on it. We don't ask anybody questions, we ask Google. We don't really ask what people are doing, we just look at their social media feed and, oh, they're doing great. They just went to Hawaii or they just went to, you know, they just got a new job. As connected as we feel we are, we're not in the deeper ways. In our consumer culture, we find ourselves curating our lives. Think about this for a minute. All of consumerism and what you're being sold in every form of media is about you having the power to curate your life, to make it exactly how you want. If you don't like hanging out with certain people, don't hang out with them. If you don't like thinking and hearing the thoughts of other people, guess what? You can cut them out. If you don't like being here, don't go there. And you can continue to make your life precise and curate it to exactly what you want. But guess where you find yourself? Alone. More isolated than ever. We see this. I don't know if you saw the Elvis movie that came out recently. It's really weird. But it's, it's another reminder of people who had everything that this world had to offer. Once again was alone, isolated, relying on addictions to get them to cope through things, and they end up losing their life because of this. The people who have everything have nothing because it, in curating their own life and getting exactly what they want, they end up alone. Well, friends, this morning, as we talk about how do we thrive in a burnout culture you, if you are in Christ, have been called to a different kind of life that isn't looking to the people around you to tell you how to live your life, to live your best life. You've been called to a new life that's in Christ, that's radically different than the world around us. And we need to make sure that we're looking to his word to define what that life looks like. Last week, we talked about how we were made to thrive with God, living in his purposes and God has given us relational rhythms for how we live in relationship with God. Jesus, when he came into this world, he showed us how to walk with God and live in sync with him every day. How to, on a weekly basis, pull ourselves back and to remind ourselves who is our sustainer, who is our author, who is our definer, and rely on him to speak into our lives. And then there is other rhythms that Jesus showed his disciples. But that wasn't it, because if you stop there, it's easy to think that Christianity is just a me and Jesus movement. It's a me and Jesus religion. If I just do these religious things on my own, that's all it is. But if that's your definition or your version of Christianity, you're missing out on the more challenging but yet the most beautiful part of that. You are not an island. You were rescued by Jesus to thrive, doing life with him and with one another as the church. You're not an island. If you've been trying to do Christianity on your own, living your best life and pulling yourselves back from being a part of the church, you're missing out on the very purpose that you were set apart for, that you were rescued for, that you were given a new life for, that is with God, with one another, as the church. It's who you are. In Romans 12, 
after Paul unpacks the gospel and how much it radically changes our life and how we're saved by grace through faith, how we're given a new identity, how we're given this new, this new life in Christ and how we're now spirit-empowered to live in this new life. Um, Paul in Romans 12 shifts and now he talks about how do you live in this new life? And guess what? Living in this new life is not you and Jesus doing your own thing curating your life to live your best life with him. Your life is meant to be with others. This is how Paul begins that chapter. He says, therefore, because of the good news, because of what God has done, because of this new life that you received, because the Holy Spirit is not working in you, because of that, therefore, I urge you, Brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. He's saying, live now because of what you've received in Christ. Now live into it together as brothers and sisters. The you in here is plural. It's a y'all, not you individually, okay? <laughs> Because of the gospel, because of what you received, now I urge you, live into what the very thing that you've been given in Christ. Together, live a distinct life, holy and pleasing to God. And then he says in verse 2, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. One of the things we talked about last week was Jesus, because he had this rhythm of every day spending time with the Father before he went about his day, his primary motive was he didn't want to go into the day living outside of the Father's will. He wanted to live in sync with the Father. He wanted his heartbeat, his mind, his purposes, his agenda for the day to be with the Father. And as we do that, guess what? We know what what the Father's good and perfect and pleasing will is. Paul continues this now how do we live thing. He continues by saying, guess what? You guys are the body of Christ and you all have different gifts and abilities. Be humble and use them together and how you exist together. And then he says, and and then also as the body, make sure that your love for one another is what guides and carries you for how you live because guess what? You're a bunch of screw ups still and there's a lot of redemption that still needs to go on. And so we're going to need a lot of grace, humility, patience, kindness, and persevering love to help us exist as the body of Christ as we seek to live out this new life together. That's the beginning part of how we we live as Christians. Now, if you're with us back in May when we were going through our series in Romans, um, on May 1st, so I'm not, we're not going to unpack Romans 12 anymore, but on May 1st, if you go back to our archives on our website, um, it's uh, part 15 of Out of the Catacomb series. We unpack Romans 12 a lot more, okay? But one of the big things I said in there, which is it's weird kind of quoting myself, but we have a communal calling in Christ. We have a communal calling in Christ. Dietrich Bonhoeffer in the 20th century heyday, where all of science was helping us understand the world going on around us, and also at a time when we're seeing that humanity, if we have all the right answers, doesn't mean we're better people. We're just as likely to do atrocious things. And Bonhoeffer being in Germany before World War II and during World War II, he got to see both of those. The genius of humanity and what they can invent, but at the same time, the, the cruel, demonic intelligence, creativity that humanity has to use it for destruction. In this world of thinking you can have answers, this is what he, he reminds his church. This is what he reminds the people he disciples. In his book, Life Together, he said, Christianity means community through Jesus Christ and in Jesus Christ. We belong to one another only through and in Jesus Christ. He wanted to set the point that if you're a Christian, you are the body of Christ. 
you are the church and you can't live as a Christian outside of existing in your communal calling as the church. One of the interesting things as we, um, as we look at what the pandemic did and as we find ourselves in this burnout culture, the engagement of the church has been, it was changing before the pandemic multiplied it. It basically fast-forwarded history to, the, to 2030, okay? It fast-forwarded where the church was going by a decade through that pandemic. And what we find is it says that regular attendance, 40% of the church regularly engages, okay? 40% of the church regularly engages. Regular being most Sundays, I know like back in the, in the 80s, the church I grew up in, it was something to be prized. And I'm not saying we should go back to this, but it was something to be prized. Like someone was faithfully attending for 10 years straight, for a decade straight, they had never missed a Sunday. The goal is not to miss a Sunday. That's not the, the, the ultimate goal of Christianity, okay? But there, there was this importance to gathering regularly, that we've seemed to be losing as we try to look, as we look to the world around us to tell us how we should be living our best life. And the pandemic, we got out of our rhythm of gathering regularly. And now on this side of it, for us as a church, that number of 40% regular attending is like 20 to 25% regular attending. And this is not to shame. This is just me laying out a reality for us to wrestle with. For most, most attendance is like once every two months. So imagine trying to be the church together, to be a family embracing our new life in Christ together as family redeemed, centered, and sent, but we only see each other every two months. How effective are we going to be as we follow Jesus? And how effective are we going to be in accomplishing the mission that God has given us as a church? It's going to be harder than I'll get out. And guess what? It's been harder than I'll get out. So what do we do with this? In a culture that's disengaged, let's be different. Let's be distinct. Let's be set apart. Let's be holy as we've been called to be as a church. And instead of being disengaged, let's be devoted to one another. In the beginning of the church movement, after Jesus went back to heaven and uh, the disciples were waiting for Pentecost, because Jesus said, wait, and the Spirit will come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth, right? So the, the church this day happens. Peter shares the gospel, and thousands of people come to Christ, and they begin this church movement. And this is how it describes the norm for the early church. It said in Acts 2, 42 to 43, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. What's the focus word? They were devoted. In a culture disengaged, we need to reclaim who we've been called to be in Christ as a devoted community. Later on, <clears throat> In, in the church life in Hebrews chapter 10, as he wants to encourage um, a church that's been facing persecution, facing different challenges, having a lot of questions as they're seeing the world begin to be resistant and persecute the church, the writer encourages the church in this way, and he says, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and to good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. He writes them to encourage them, hey, you guys, you're, one of your greatest strengths that you have to face 
these challenging times and seasons and persecution and things that we know nothing of as the American church. He says, as you go through things, do not forget the power that you have together. Because when you're following Christ together, you're going to be able to spur one another on when you're, when you're wanting to just check out and just go with the, the motions of the world around you. You're going to want to not meet because um, the more intimate you get with people and getting to know people, you realize that they're, they're, they're just as messed up as you are. And then you have to like put down your comfortability and you start acting out as well. It's uncomfortable. But that's what helps us remind ourselves that we need Jesus more than anything else. They had a habit of doing life together. And he said, do not lose this habit of spurring one another on and doing life together because you're going to need it all the more until you see Christ return because it's not going to get easier. It's going to get harder. Are you hearing this? We had this uh, neighbor at our first house that we owned, um, and there was this young couple, um, great couple. We got to know them a little bit, but we noticed that most of the year, the wife was by herself. Her husband was playing hockey in Europe, and so nine or ten months out of the year, he was gone. They started to have kids. They had two. And after three years, four years of doing this, they, their, their marriage ended in a divorce. And I, I remember in the beginning of knowing that he was gone playing hockey for nine to ten months out of the year. They were living two separate lives, even though they were married. And if you're away long enough, it's easy to feel disconnected. It's easy to feel like you, you don't know each other. It's easy to feel like you don't have the same purpose, you're doing your own purposes, and that is the chemistry for disruption and failure and burnout. This reminds me of the, if regularly attending is once every two months, can you really have a thriving, life-giving relationship in unity, shared purpose, encouraging, knowing each other, helping each other grow in the fullness of Christ? You can't. I know there's many. I mean, if you look at, at our church, our church is not the same as on the other side of the pandemic. And it had nothing to do with arguments over racism, arguments of Trumpism, arguments of other things. Those weren't the things that made people leave our church. It was getting comfortable with life outside of gathering with the church. Church in Christ you cannot be okay with being disengaged from the church. Now, here's the thing. As I say this, I'm not trying to tongue lash you, okay? What I'm trying is to, to capture the same urging that Paul had in Romans 12 for how do we live in our new life together. We cannot be, thrive in that new life with Christ without each other. We need one another. And if you're here this morning, it's because you valued gathering regularly, okay? So this might not be, this, uh, this almost feels like a preaching to the choir moment, okay? Um, but this is something for you to think about for when you engage with others and you hear the, the distorted, same old line of, you don't have to go to church to be a Christian, okay? That's a, that's a misleading line built on a really screwed up understanding of what it means to be a Christ follower with the church. Okay? So what can we tell them? Or what can we remind ourselves? We cannot be okay with being disengaged from the church for this reason. In Ephesians 4, as Paul describes who you are as the church, this is what Paul says about who you are in Christ. Okay? He says, so Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, the, and the teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and we become mature, 
attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Anyone want to grow into maturity and experience the full measure of Christ living inside of us? Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching or by cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, and that is Christ. From him, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and it builds itself up in love as each part does its work. I love this passage, and if you know me, you've heard me say this multiple times, especially if you've been part of leadership stuff. This is a defining description of how the church should be functioning. We all have a role to play. Christ has given you all a different role to play, whether it's an apostle, a prophet, an evangelist, a shepherd, and teacher. And it's not to say, oh, look how awesome I am, and look at me, I got a badge that says I'm an apostle or I'm a shepherd, okay? It's you've been given a calling in the life of the church to help one another grow into maturity, to grow into the fullness and the character of Christ so that we can not only become mature, but so that when there's crazy teachings going around, when there's scheming going around, we're able to be steadfast because we have each other's backs and we're reminding each other of the truth that we are building our lives upon. And we grow in the maturity together. So to be okay with being disengaged from the church is to throw this and cut this out of your Bible and say, I have no need for this. But if we do that, this is what we're doing. To be okay being disengaged from the church is to do this, according to Ephesians 4. It's to reject Jesus. If you're okay being disengaged, you're rejecting Jesus, not Pastor Jim, not any other pastor, okay, not a denomination. You're rejecting Jesus because Jesus has set you apart for a different role in the life of the church to live into this calling. And if you're like, nope, not going to do it, you're telling Jesus no. Secondly, you're refusing your role and purpose, okay? When we, when we lose our role and purpose, then what do we have left? We're left to our own demises. We're left to our own life. Is like, my goal is just to be happy, and I'm going to do whatever I need to be happy. And then we go down that rabbit trail, and we end up empty and broken, To be okay being disengaged from the church is to reject Jesus, it's to refuse your role and purpose, but it's also to resist growing in maturity. You cannot show up and engage in community and read a thousand books a year, and you might have more knowledge, but it doesn't mean you're more mature, because head knowledge and life knowledge and how you live are two different things. Yes, you need head knowledge. But if you're not living it out, guess what? You become more prideful. You become more set apart because these people don't think like you. And so what do you do? You become more isolated. You become more self-righteous. And guess what? Last time I knew, self-righteousness doesn't lead to holiness. It leads to self-destruction and fooling yourself. So to be okay being disengaged from the church is to reject Jesus It's to refuse your role and purpose. It's to resist growing maturity. Now, if we're okay with that, then we got to ask ourselves, do we really want to be Christians? Because if this is what it means to be a Christian and how we live into that Christian life and we're saying no to it, then we're saying no to Jesus and the gospel in which we're saved. These are some harsh words, but we need to communicate this and embody this and remind ourselves of where we live right now and how we're living right now. If we're living okay with this, we're wasting our lives and we're following, we're, we're moving farther and farther away from Jesus. So here's my encouragement for you. 
is to reclaim the rhythm of gathering regularly as the church. I'm not promoting religion this morning. I'm promoting you living into the Christian calling that you've been given if you're in Christ. And we need to gather regularly because when we're not gathering regularly, we're doing Christianity on our own. We're not helping one another grow into maturity. We're not living into our calling that Jesus has given us and our role and purpose in life of the church. Therefore, we're, 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 we're missing out. When I say gathering regularly, for many people, we've allowed the, the world around us or church culture to define what church is, the whole going to church mindset. I'm not saying go to church. What I'm saying is something deeper and richer than that. It's be the church who gathers regularly. <laughs> so how does this look for us? How do we live into this as new life? Here's how we do life together. One, there's this, right? Sunday worship. You're not coming to church. You're coming to worship with your church, okay? I fight on a daily basis when I text or when I email or something or when I speak to not say, um, oh, it's at the church. The, the door is not working at the church. The internet is down at the church. I fight on a daily basis to make sure that our language communicates the reality that we're trying to live in. So it's, it takes a little bit longer, but I have to say the door is not working at the church building. The internet is down at the church building so that we don't continue to cultivate that wrong language in the life of our leadership. This is a building. You are the church. Okay? So, but we, on Sundays, we gather to worship. To worship is we look to God to be our author, our definer of our lives. We say you are the most important thing or person in all of creation. You are the most important, and I want to not only remind you, not remind us as we tell him that, but we also want to be reminded of who he is and why he is the only one worthy of our worship. And we want to be formed by that. We want to, we want to allow the gospel to keep reorienting us for week after week after week so that as we go into our week, we're reminded I'm saved by grace, but I'm called to live by faith. I'm empowered by the Spirit. And every morning, his mercies are new to go and get at it. We need this in our lives. But here's some of the ways, I'll be honest with you. On this side of the pandemic, it's taken a while to get out of the rut for how we were doing worship by only doing live stream worship. And you guys being comfortable in your couches and drinking your coffee and me being really jealous, okay? Um, one of the ruts that we got into was, well, if nobody's here and we're hitting record, we were worshiping with three people. John or DJ on Sunday, Megan and myself here um, doing the live stream, and that's what, it got easy, right? We do everything, and we hope you tune in, but that's not what it means to be to church. It's not what it means to go to church, and like a lot of churches, we've struggled to get out of the rut of, all right, church, how do we worship together? How do we create a space, a sacred moment where we gather together and we worship together instead of how do we try to convince you to come back to watch us worship, okay? So here's what, here's what I'm promising, and we're going to be talking about this more next week as we do our relaunch, but this morning, as we, we, we want you to know some things that we're doing to shape worship. We're not just going through the motions. We're not just picking three songs and me writing a sermon and then picking two more songs and then that's it for worship. <coughs> There's a lot more that goes into it because we're trying to create a time of worship where you are engaged with a holy God with one another beside each other. So here's some of the things that we're aiming towards when we gather on Sunday. We're aiming for you to be in awe of God. Not by creating some new ways to be like, oh yeah, God's awesome, and it's like a, a fleeting excitement, but we want you to encounter God himself and his character and what he's done where you say, whoa, okay? That's what we're aiming for every Sunday. We're also wanting you to experience a gospel narrative as we worship. 
We begin with God in the beginning. We talk about redemption, the good news, and how we're saved by grace. Then we center around God's word to say, okay, God, now who am I? How are you calling me to live? What do I need to, to, to be reminded of? What do I need to be taught so that I can go then live it out? You know why we do announcements at the end of the service? It's because if we're going to give an announcement, it's going to be not ways to busy your life, but it's to invite you into living sent with us, okay? But that's the flow of how we worship. We also are working on, we want to make sure that worship is engaging. We want, you, we want to help you almost be like a, um, uh, what's the word called? We want to be the birthing wife, okay, for you to worship God. That's our role as worship leaders and, and for me as the pastor, as we want to be um, the midwife for you to worship. We want to lead you, coach you along the way to not just watch us do our thing, right? The midwife in a, in a, in a birthing moment, it's not about them. They're the facilitators of something bigger going on, the mom giving birth to her child. We want to help you worship. So as we as we are practicing and planning and organizing what we do, we're working on making sure that we can do this in an engaging way, not putting on a show. We also want to make sure that as you gather, we're, we're preaching contextually. We don't want you to hear a sermon that makes you feel good for a moment and then you go back to your life. We want to make sure that if we have this moment with a pastor who has a master's of divinity, um, who's had a lifetime of experiences and wrestling with how to follow Jesus, you're going to hear a sermon that's not about what Jim wants to tell you and, and manipulate you with, but it's going to be contextual. We're going to look at God's word in its context and then look at our context and say, how do we live this here and now? That's what you can expect. It's not going to be a waste of time, and I will not waste words to just fill in space to make you look at me for this long because it's kind of awkward. To think about it, if that's all we're doing. We also want it to be formational. When you come and worship with us on Sunday, we want to make sure that this is a formational time, that as you walk away, you're thinking in a different way, you're beginning to feel something in a new way, you're beginning to be given tools to live out a different life. That is our goal on Sundays. Does that sound meaningful? I say that all by saying, I know we're not perfect, I know we have a long ways to go, but that is what our goal is, because that's what the goal of worship is supposed to be. Second way that we do life together is through missional community. I think through the pandemic and everything, we had one missional community that, that was ticking through it, okay? The irony is they were ticking through it because uh, they were a community of people who were devoted to one another, and they were devoted to gathering regularly, <clears throat> And that's what sustained them through the pandemic. But as we go into this fall, you're going to hear more information next week, but we do life through missional communities. If you've never heard that word, um, missional community is a social space. It's not about intimacy where you're going to sit there and stare at each other and share your feelings, okay? Because most guys wouldn't be there, okay? It's a social space. A family is a social space where you do a few things. You have, you have dinner together. Okay? You spend time in God's word together. You love and care for each other. And then you find ways to serve together. That is the, that is the, the, um, the ethos or the, the, the space where we as a church embrace our new life in Christ together as family, redeemed, son, and sent. That's that space where we begin to learn how to love each other like Romans 12, that's that space where, where we teach one another how to follow Jesus as we share stories of how we're learning to follow Jesus in our day of what he's teaching us and how we're living it out. And when we, when we say something uh, hurtful or when we say something dumb and we hurt each other's feelings, that's that space where we learn about that beautiful thing called reconciliation where you, where you apologize, you forgive one another, you extend grace, and you work through the conversations of bringing people back together in reconciliation, which is the, one of the most beautiful pictures of what the gospel does. So if, you've been, if you haven't been a part of one, man, this fall, as we get going again, I want to invite you to be in a community that's accomplishing this. The third thing is discipleship. The way that we do discipleship is we're not here just to teach you information, okay? 
We're here to, sh to help you, one, know Jesus, but also how to follow him in your everyday life. What's the point of learning knowledge if you don't know how to follow Jesus in everyday life? Jesus came. He made disciples teach them how to follow him in the everyday life. He didn't just sit down and say, all right, here's my scroll. Memorize all of this stuff. But that's not all that we do in discipleship. We also help you live into your calling and be learning how to become like Jesus, but also how to lead like Jesus in the areas that he's called you to, to love and to lead in the life of the church. So this year, as we relaunch, this is what we're inviting you into, okay? Don't be okay being disengaged. Let's re-engage and let's be the church because as we do that, we're going to thrive. What I love about this is, what I love about this is uh, as we do this, we're going to thrive. We're going to allow something else to define our lives. We're going to um, have people that we're, we, that we're connected and, and we know deeply and richly that when we're going through moments of crisis, we're going to have people who have our backs. One of the things I love about relationships that I had back in college because they were rooted in Christ, not in going to dorm parties, okay? The people that I, that I, that I, that I run into that were outside of Christ, that were like friends I knew because we lived in the same dorm together or we, we played football together or whatever what, what those things were, it's like I don't know them because one, it was a long time ago. <laughs> but two, uh, the, the people who I followed Christ with in college I can call them up today, and it feels like no time has been gone because of, of the equity that we built in that relationship 20-some years ago. We can contact each other, and boom. Yes, a lot of things have changed and, and have happened in our lives, but the one thing that holds it all together is our faith in Christ, and we can talk about those things. It's awesome. So I have some questions for you this morning. The first one is this. Where is your devotion? When you think about your life, what have you been devoted to with your life? What's been, what's been consuming your dreaming? What's been consuming your time, your resources? What have you been devoted to? And be honest about that. The second question is this. What's holding you back from re-engaging into community on this side of the pandemic or maybe even before then? What, what's holding you back? There could be a lot of different reasons. It could be um, guilt, shame. It could be pride. It could be um, you're busy doing other things and you're like, I just don't have time. What's holding you back? Third question, how is Jesus calling you into belonging and being the church. Church, this morning, I want to invite you to reclaim the rhythm of gathering regularly as a church. Not for religious purposes, but for relational purposes with God and each other that helps you thrive in a burnout culture. Because as we do this, we'll get to see what God does in and through us. And what did we see happen in Acts 2.43? It said they were devoted to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to breaking of bread, to prayer and all those things. And then it said in, in uh, verse 43, the result, the fruit of that, it said everyone was filled with awe. And when you say everyone, it's everyone who is gathering, okay? Man, as they, as they began this new thing called the church together, they were filled with awe as they began to see what God was doing in their midst. All these crazy people who had different ethnic backgrounds, who had different philosophical backgrounds, who had different financial backgrounds, they were gathering and loving and caring for each other. They were becoming a body, serving one another in those ways. And people were like, holy cow, this is awesome. But then... The everyone in this, in this line also is the people around them, the people that were seeing them gather, the people that were, uh, that were existing in their, in their world around them were seeing them, and they were also in awe. 
And that was their primary way of reaching more for, reaching more for Christ. Their witness of how they gathered together, their existence made people say, whoa, what is going on? This is something different. This isn't some philosophy. This isn't some religion. This, isn't some, this is something that's real, that's alive. Let's reclaim, reclaim the rhythm of gathering regularly as a church, and let's see what God does in us and through us. Because I'm expecting awe. I'm expecting this fruit that only God can do in us and through us and the world around us. Church, let's claim this. In a burnout world, let's thrive with Christ and each other. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your design. Lord, you know what we, what we need because you made us. You know the challenges that we face as humans because you became one of us. You know the challenges of living in community because you did it with us. Lord, we pray that you'll help us allow you to define what it means to be the church, that we will allow you to be the Lord that guides our life. Lord, we know you are good. We know you know what you're doing because this universe has been spinning around for a long, long time, longer than our lives. Lord, I pray that you would give us faith to look to you, that you'd give us the faith to put down any of the walls that we put up that's kept us from regularly gathering and being the church together. Father, I, help, I pray that you would help us reclaim being, being the beautiful church and how we love and care for each other um, so that we not only thrive, but we get to see you do some awesome things. Lord, you did not call us to a religion that's full of motions the end of just doing things, but you called us to a life with you that yes, there's motions, there's practices, there's rhythms to our life, but they're not the end in themselves. They are the vehicles for how we live in relationship with you and the life that you've given us in Christ. Lord, we thank you. We pray that you'll help us as we step into this. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.